Oh. Hello. Just checking if this works. Um, first of all, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mehdi, Isabel, and Uri, to, for having me here. So, it's, as you probably expected, it's a last-minute uh, keynote, so it's kind of a last-minute slide as well. Um, I've been thinking a lot about technology, and I try to gather my thoughts, so it'd be nice to me. It's the first time I actually do that kind of presentation. I just... Uh, let me see if this works. Could No? The other one? Ah, technology. <laughs> That's actually uh, the summarized of my old keynote in one. <laughs> technology doesn't always work. Do you have another uh, little thing like this, possibly? Anyone? <laughs> ah, sad, because I was going to actually... Oh, sure. Ah! I wanted to... So you have to aim the TV. I just wanted to um, thank the organization about, you know, the, the real-life targeting. That was the, the hotel room, you can see. Uh, ah, you guys are API. Here it is. And uh, you don't speak French, John, but j'ai de la chance. I'm not sure you're lucky when you're in this room. <laughs> so... As I said, I, I'd like to, to talk about what I call the post-internet world. And one of the reasons I... Ah, there's possibly no... Do you have a... No, there's no... I'll try again. I think it worked when you have your two hands here, but I'm not totally sure. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe? Maybe? Where did he go? <laughs> of course. Mm. Uh. Yeah. Almost. Uh, you mean, there was conferences where you have to ask the person, next slide. I could also do this if you want, but... So, who has any clue what's this on screen by any chance? Ah. You guys are engineers, tech developers. At least one in your life, you should at least see the mother of all demos, but actually had his 50th anniversary. This guy, Doug, probably was on LSD the day of, uh, of, uh, of the demo with um, one an incredible person called Stuart Brand, who is also known for inventing the concept of a personal computer. People kind of forget, but back in the 60s, working in computers was kind of seen as something bad. Because if you worked in computers, you were basically either working to create this huge bureaucracy in the States, or you were fighting the war in Vietnam. And most people who were like, gifted and loved the idea of using technology in computers didn't like this, this idea of being you know, an agent of this kind of, of process. So the idea of the computer being the way of emancipate humans came around the same time. And by the way, Doug invented the mouse, the graphical user interface, everything, and it looked cooler back then than it actually looked now on a, even our old device. Mm. Uh, maybe next slide, I'll see. Yes? Ah. Okay. <laughs> say again? Oh. So, we could all like, you could all clap your hands and congratulate yourself. Let's do this. We made it. Three quarters of the population is now online, thanks to people like us. That's what Ben Evans from um, Andreessen Horowitz called the access story. But now come the real question. What do we do about it? <laughs> I mean, think about it. The, such a power, you can reshape the architecture of the world. Politics, culture, everything can be redesigned. And this is probably what I would love to talk about. So, quickly, a uh, few words about myself. I, uh, I started as a, what you would call a hacker in the 80s. I had this 
friend one day who called me and said, just use your Minitel. We had a Minitel. I know a lot of French here had this use the same device, dumb device, free modem offered by the government, basically, and said, oh, connect to my phone number. And I did this, and I connected to his Commodore 64. I guess some of you have used such device. I don't know if anyone is using a, a Commodore back in the days. <laughs> and it was mind-blowing. I couldn't sleep. And the day after I came to him and I said, oh, by the way, we need to change the user interface, we need to change the login and this and that. And I was 12, it was 84. Um, and at that time I discovered that basically I was meant to work with computers and user interfaces. One day I saw a movie called Mille Milliards de Dollars and uh, I decided I wanted to become a journalist. And I went to the craziest newspaper you could go to, called Actuel. It was owned by the founder of Radio Nova. And I told him, yeah, you guys wrote something about cyberpunk, but it's all BS, maybe. He said, stop, I stop you right there. If you want to write about it, welcome. So I covered the early days of the internet, the Burning Man, the uh, EFF, the, the rise of the, the dot-com era in, uh, in Silicon Valley. It was quite mind-blowing. And then, of course, as everyone else, you go there and you say, well, one day I was doing an interview and I kind of saw myself coming out of the table and looking the other guy and I said, I want to be that guy. So I decided I would become an entrepreneur. So I started doing a bunch of things. Mostly, I was into music back days and in San Francisco it was the boom of online music, MP3s, Napster, so I read, started working in that space. But one of the companies I'm most well known of is NetVibes was one of the very first, actually, uh, one of the really first uh, widget-based platform. It was the early days of what we call the Web 2.0. The Web 2.0, if you don't know what it is, was three years where everything could change before the iPhone came in and commoditized the entire world. <laughs> and um, I left to create another uh, company, and uh, that was a crazy project back then. It was actually way ahead of the Google Chromebook to build an HTML5-based operating system with a computer. We built it. We actually created the user interface. Everything you see on the screen here was HTML5. We used we're kind of the first, very first company uh, using Node at that level. Uh, uh, the entire OS was pretty much uh, quite uh, marvelous compared to, uh, to what Chrome OS was doing at the time. And then, well, we discovered that competing after Google is quite tough. <laughs> especially when they decide that the project you're working on is going to be a priority for them. So we had a hard time uh, keeping them and we decided to stop. And <clears throat> three years ago, kind of came this idea of, oh, I kind of want to try to do the same thing again, but differently. And uh, one of the, I believe, one of the most interesting things to do these days is to take back control of our digital life. I mean, we gave up so much. How do we take back? So we've been working on a form of ethical framework. It's called Dissident.ai. I wouldn't call it a company yet. It's more like an initiative. We've created an online desktop where you can unify your entire stack of, soft, uh, of, of storage. Everything works in the web. Everything is HTML5 again, because at the end, if it's not web, it means that you're working on someone else's platform, and you don't really have uh, the power to decide what you want to do. And we're working as well on a library where we basically curating all the information around the world in one place, also using open format, HTML5, and open web. That's it. I'm not going to talk about myself anymore. Uh, as you can see, I'm worried. Actually, uh, I've been thinking about this. I mean, if you think about it, look at the world the last three years. Just look at the world the last three years. Such a disaster, right? And technology is probably the main reason of it. I'm also angry because I sometimes ask myself this question. How is it possible that Europe, by the way, Europe invented the two core technology of the internet, Linux, Finland, and a bit, some of it happened here and all over, and the web at CERN, 93. How is it possible that the technology we built, designed, became the technology that dominated us? And especially as, you, as a European, I always wonder, like, how is it possible that we actually had everything in place and we didn't do anything about it? As you probably know, I have kind of an answer. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
By the way, we love people when they're famous. Not before. And now, if you go at the CERN, this is this, uh, this, this little thing there, say, oh, the web is invented here. It's great, fantastic. So everything happens in 1993, basically. 1993 was Clinton just got elected uh, as president. And you can see him with John Doerr, one of the investors of Google. And the they decided that the future of the, in the US would be what they call the information superhighway. It was a fancy name, but basically it was the internet. The next wave of growth in the US would happen through the internet. They opened the uh, uh, NSFnet, uh, the uh, education network, which started like getting a lot of people building uh, uh, ISPs, and basically the commercial internet was getting there. And they had the full backup of the government. At the same time, the EU had a different plan. The vision of the EU, and I swear to God, it's exactly this, was to produce clean diesel. 25 years ago, Google and Facebook dominate the world, and the CEO of Audi is in prison, in jail, for cheating on the emission of CO2. And if you're in Paris, and if you've been in Paris for a few weeks, you've probably seen a bunch of people, the yellow vest, being angry. And I understand. For years, we told them, you should buy this stuff. You should buy a diesel car. We created incentive. That was part of the whole vision of the EU. And look where we are now. If you have any doubt that politics and technology are not connected now, you could be more than mistaken. I mean, it's a circle. It will always be a circle, no matter who is there. So over the few years, I've been coming through the, with the idea of a slow web. And uh, slow web, of course, is um, not the web that is too slow because you're on a modem or you're on a, on a very bad connection. But going back to the idea of a slow life, slow living, slow food, the idea that technology is here to give you time to enjoy your life, not taking time away from you. And sometimes I'm trying to explain this with a long sentence, and a few pictures could work as well. So with technology, we came the culture of growth, the culture of more, optimize, winners take all. That's actually what the internet is all about. If you can jump on the dead body of your competitors and kill them, look at the, uh, you know, Facebook had some of the papers uh, came out in the, in the UK Parliament last week, and you can see how Zook was super aggressive, but he was doing his job. I mean, everybody in Silicon Valley is super aggressive. Take it all, destroy everything, be the leader, make sure no one else can breathe. That's the hyper growth. And now, just think for a second. If you were not in technology, but you were in food, what kind of business that means? It means stuff that you wouldn't like to eat, right? <laughs> I always give the example of the, the mac and cheese because uh, it's a favorite in the US. But uh, the company who started doing mac and cheese started optimizing and growth hacking. And at some point in the 80s, there was no cheese in the mac and cheese at all. I mean, as you probably know, there's even people that believe that Kentucky Fried Chicken shouldn't be called chicken because we don't really know <laughs> what's in there. But the practice of the food industry, especially in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, were quite terrible. And uh, something changed. We started eating better, organic. Um, we started taking the time to eat food that we cook, not things that are processed in a box, with like numbers that none of us have any clue of, you know, E22 something. So, at the end of the day, we live in a world where we have too much technology. We were discussing yesterday, there's nothing on my phone today that I didn't have 10 years ago. Email, Uber, everything is there. What has changed now is the technology is trying to take over my free time. And technology is also trying to do things that I'm not sure are good for me. So it's all come back to the values. 
you know, taking the time. You're building software to be with people, not to be on people. The idea of crafting and doing good work. I'm sure a lot of you put so much work into the product. And I've been so much inspired. I've been spending the last two, three years working with Chef, looking at how they do things. It's unbelievable, you know. The ability not to deliver quality, but deliver quality every day. The same level of quality, of passions, of passion. Things that we do with our hands. Basically, the exact opposite of what a smartphone is today. And getting through there, I basically kind of worked out three principles that I would love to share with you. Uh, the first one is transparency. It's funny because when we use a phone, you're on Facebook or your Instagram, you're going to do things. The screen is going to show you you're doing things like, I'm liking something, someone, someone else's photo. So the little thing is becoming blue, I liked it. So for me, it feels like, okay, the other person is going to get a notification, I liked it. But I liked it. And, but the truth is, it's not that that happens. In the back, hundreds of things happen. You're scoring, edge rank is changing, uh, an AI has analyzed everything in the photo, and now they believe that you're crazy of dogs, or you like ice cream, and they're going to reshuffle everything to the advertiser. So all of these things that happen in the back, you don't know about. They never tell you. The software is not transparent anymore. Back in the days, you had a computer, you would copy a file. The computer would tell you, you're copying a file, and that's what they do, nothing else. Now, reading an email, watching a video, doing anything on a software has also unintended consequences that you're not aware of. I always, when we talk about private data, is you don't even need to tell people, oh, give me your data, just ask them to do photos. You have everything in the photo, <laughs> you have the location. Now with machine learning, you know everything on the photo, you can acquire so much data. And no wonder, Every uh, Apple or Samsung a keynote is all about, oh, can you see my camera is so much better than the last one, and so on and so on. So the, I think photos are becoming like, are passive, you know, the, we're just feeding data to the beast. The problem of transparency is as well, like, you're thinking, oh, I, I am reading this, I'm watching this, I'm listening to this. Who would actually decide, want to share publicly their political opinions? Not a lot of people. But everything you do online now is in some way defining your political opinions or scoring or your ability to, to, to be a wise uh, financial uh, person or being in health. It's incredible the amount of data that has been provided and but we don't even know how they impact our life. If you're looking at this and not me, it means you understand <laughs> this one, manipulations. This is level two, you know, we talk about Cambridge Analytica and the oil spill of data. But the next step is programming people, changing your mood. Think about it, you wake up, oh, it's great, I'm gonna have a coffee. Then. Big mistake, you take your iPhone or your smartphone and suddenly something you can't stand happens to be on the screen or someone you can't stand. And you're like, this thing just ruined my day. Of course, it's made on purpose. We're not the same people when we're happy, when we're sad. We don't sell the same advertising when we're happy, when we're sad. This, in, this idea that we can control people is becoming quite big and look, elections, what I call algorithmic radicalization, where suddenly you're on Facebook or on, on YouTube and you're just watching something and then something else came out. Of course, privacy. So I'd like to change your entire view of privacy, if I may say so. Because when we think about privacy, we think about the GDPR, we think about so many things, Basically, we think about this. 
Like how are data being swallowed all day long? But that's not privacy. Think about it when you were a kid and uh, you were like asking your mom for privacy. Would you ask your mom, okay, you can put a camera in my house, but only on that side, not on that side. No, just leave me alone. Privacy should be something a bit similar to what Google has done and others with the incognito mode. A switch off, leave me alone. Think about it. I, was, I, I thought about algorithm one day when a friend who had Netflix years ago, that was before they separated the different, uh, you know, different profiles, told me, I came one day and the entire screen was about Dora, the exploratress. The exploratrice is like a kid's thing. And of course, he let his kids play with Netflix and the entire algorithm had changed. But you could have like this kind of guilty pleasure where you love to listen to something or watch something that is not your usual official tag behavior. And that would alter the algorithm in any way. There's no way for you to say, well, right now I want some privacy. I want to be on my own. What I do is not something that is tagged, analyzed, or taken away. This is what we should fight for, real privacy. I think that you, and especially you who are building software, have the power to, uh, to make this vision happen. You have the power to decide how people are going to use your software. And I also believe that a lot of people on top of you who will say, no, 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 that's how we should do it. You should raise your voice. I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't do your work, people who have no clue how to code won't be able to push the project. I think it's very important that as a software developer, as an engineer, as a project manager, you're getting into this and make sure that what you build are conform to the values of your life. The problem is, you know, the narrative has changed too fast. In some ways, 10 years ago, technology is our best friend. It's going to change the world. It's amazing. And now, of course, uh, it's the opposite. Technology is going to destroy the world, and AI is going to kill us. Um, over the last few years, we started seeing the narrative changing between, yeah, it's a race, it's an, the new arm race. AI is the new arm race. On one side, the US, or the, the GAFA, the FANG, as we call them in the UK, and China, they're going to dominate, creating these supercomputers. Hmm. I mean, yes, of course, there's so much money poured in technology. But I think the, the separation is going to be between two types of people. What I now call the digital supremacist. People who believe that technology should run the world, and only technology should run the world. More data organizing the world better. In some ways, we're trading philosophy as a way to understand the world with data. And that is, for people like me, kind of a problem. And you're going to have this data supremacist who wants this vision to be established everywhere against the rest of the world. And I believe that probably most of you came to technology because, oh, I just want to have an easy job. I don't want to be political. I don't want to be in the front of all the problems. Guess what? You're into it <laughs> in your, under your neck. I mean, now technology is politics. Whatever you do, whatever your company do, will have an impact on the world. Before leaving the stage to a possibly question, I'm not sure what's... Uh, what's uh, I just want to remember that, uh, that sentence a friend of mine told me years ago. The computer took over the world and 15 minutes later, it ran out of batteries. The thing is, uh, we always use the more low as you know, the, the way of, of, of quantifying our progress, but right now we're stuck. We're stuck with batteries, we're stuck with rare earth materials. The next wars will be around this. I don't know if you read the book from Guillaume Pitron on the, the battle of rare earth, but if you're in technology, you should absolutely read this kind of books, understanding the new geopolitics of how things works, how the future will be designed. 
I mean, we're living in a fascinating time because we achieved something incredible. We connected three quarters of the world to the internet. Now our mission is to make sure that people live well, nice and well on this world. Thank you very much.